Welcome back, everybody, to the card chatter with Retractor Jones and Bobbles and Ball Cards. Uh, this is our weekly Monday episode. This is going to be episode number 22, and I hope you all have had a wonderful weekend. Uh, thank you to everybody out there that has commented. I, I've seen the comments. I'm glad you guys are enjoying the show, whether you are listening on the podcast streams or over on the YouTube channel um as always want to throw up the shout out for mason forelli and his wonderful job working with mason's mission to uh, try to raise a little bit of money to help other uh, pediatric cancer patients and their families who may be struggling so uh, mason if you listen as always sir we really appreciate what you try to do for others and we will do our best to support you as well so um, with that, how was your weekend, Refractor? How, how has it been going? <laughs> it's been an interesting weekend. I, I just want to say real quick, love you, little sir. That that would be to Mason. So, um, but uh, but otherwise, I'm I'm okay. I guess I didn't I didn't get to the the show that I wanted to get to this weekend. I had some other things going on, some family things. So, um, I, I missed. Are you, are you sure you're okay? Yeah. I mean, so. I know we we just touched briefly before getting into this and before I hit record because it's a little bit later than we normally do on Sunday nights to record this episode. Uh, but you know we like to do the water cooler talk, go over some football scores. Oh uh, no, we have baseball playoffs starting up, so that's interesting. We can discuss that a little bit of what's going are, on there. Are you saying I'm on my way to being eight and eight? I'm like, I mean, are you okay? Because y'all got walloped by the Jets. Oh man, I didn't even look at the score yet. I, I mean, I, that's how that's how bad it. You know, it's I'm going to tell you this: today. the Jets put up forty. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? With Wilson at quarterback. Well, I mean, you know, he, he is he is a good quarterback. I mean, he's, he's better than two. I'd, I'd, rather have, he had I'd rather have him zero touchdowns. Mm -hmm. They put up 40 with Zach Wilson throwing zero touchdowns. Mm -hmm. So you're saying my 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 defense played like your defense. What I'm saying is, is you guys allowed 135 yards on the ground, <laughs> five touchdowns. <laughs> okay, so you we got also our had Teddy B playing for the concussed recovering Tua. Mm -hmm. who had one pass attempt, and Teddy B apparently is now in the concussion protocol. I'm guessing you all's offensive line is just trash because now you're on your third quarterback, which I don't know if you know his name, but it is Mr. Skyler Thompson. I No, I don't. I mean, that's pretty bad. I, <laughs> I mean, I mean I, it looks like they're going to be going to the practice squad to pull somebody. Well, I mean, he didn't do so bad. He was 19 of 33, 166 yards. He had one oh, okay. interception. Okay. Uh, but it looks like, you know, it looks like the defense held Zach Wilson in check. Um, but they had four different players have rushing touchdowns. Uh, Brees Hall had 97 yards and a touchdown. Michael Carter had two touchdowns on the ground. Oh, 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 oh. Dang it. Sorry about that. Hopefully that doesn't bring us from there. I forgot I was on ESPN and they play highlights. Um, anyway. You, you uh, just wanted to rub it in a little bit more, right? No, no. Uh, Braxton Berrios had one carry for 15 yards of a touchdown. Zach had four for a massive amount of two yards um, and one touchdown. So so they were, they were at home though, right, in New York? Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. want to say that, but – it was 40 to 17. So we're, we're going to just go with that. I mean, like Zach, Zach's playing for them. Jersey women, man, those mid 40 year olds. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was 40 to 17. So <laughs> I, that was a surprise, right? Um, but let's get into some other scores. I'm not going to rub that in too hard. Uh, the, the wounds are open, um, you know, third string guy. You're still, you still got a winning record. Um, you could be like my team who's playing currently, uh, the Ravens. I seen the stat today, and I knew it's been bad. I knew it's been bad. 
If you had a team going into week five that was 500, two and two, you would think, okay, you know, they, they haven't been so bad, right? Sure. But two and two record, just a guesstimate. How long would you think that team had been trailing in the in in their four football games across the four weeks? How long do you think they had been trailing to have a two and two record? Well, I mean, you you would think maybe m- maybe half, if if even that. But I'm I'm sure you're going to tell me that the Ravens would, were were trailing like what eight eight nine quarters. Eight nine quarters. Yeah. How about More. fourteen seconds? Really? That's it. In four games, they have trailed for a total of fourteen, of 14 seconds. seconds. How the hell are you two and two? Both losses, they had huge leads. <laughs> they have been trailing Christ. for fourteen seconds. Going into week five of the NFL season and have a two and two record. Well, I mean, you would think, you know, you, you would think they'd be down a quarter here, or, you know. Yeah, you would think maybe 30 there. minutes, even, you know, that's two quarters. You yeah, know? like, you know. I've seen that stat and it I mean, almost like it just rubbed the salt in the wounds even more. It's like it's bad enough for two and two, but you see that and you're like, how is that even possible? Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Seconds and two yeah. losses. In that's, 14 seconds being behind in the game. That's easily uh, right one of your now, that's um, one of your bar trivia questions you could throw out there and make some money on. It's crazy. I mean, that's nuts. Uh that game's got 250 left in the first quarter right now against Cincinnati with Baltimore, and Baltimore is leading. <laughs> they have not trailed in this game. So uh we're still at 14 seconds. Uh, but anyway, let's get into some others. We got the Colts, they um, won a snooze fest uh people have hated like they're saying this is one of the fir- the worst football games they've ever watched um but the colts beat denver broncos 12 to 9 in overtime uh giants came back on green bay they won their game 27 22 yeah that yeah that one i heard I, you know i was i was in the car and i heard that one yeah, I mean, the Giants that was across the pond, right? Four and one. Uh, Daniel Jones had no touchdowns, but again, looks like you know, it's interesting how many rushing touchdowns are happening. Giants had three rushing touchdowns. Um, Daniel Jones had Sa- no Saquon's Saquon's healthy, then, right? Yeah, he only had 13 carries, but he had 70 yards and a touchdown. So, um, let's see here. Uh, Buffalo and Pittsburgh. So, Kenny Pickett. He he gets the start. Uh, he has I'm sure he got rocked. He had three hundred twenty-seven yards. Um, another pick. Um, but the Bills beat them huh? thirty-eight to three. Um, Gabe Davis had three receptions, two touchdowns. Total of 171 yards on only three receptions. So massive day for him. He only touched the ball three times, but massive day nonetheless. Uh, so 38 to three there. You had the Chargers slipping through. Uh, they beat the Bills, scored a field goal in the fourth quarter to carry a 30 to 28 lead over the Browns. Uh, Nick Chubb had another strong performance, 17 carries, 134 yards, two touchdowns, but it was not enough. Uh, Herbert only had 228 and a touchdown. Austin Eckler had 16 carries, 173 yards and a touchdown. So a big game for both running backs on both the Chargers and the Browns there. Uh, Let's see, rolling over Houston. They beat Jacksonville. Jacksonville is now two and three. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, 286 and two picks. Uh, Davis Mills had only 140 yards, but again, the ru- the ground game, 99 yards for Damian Pierce with a touchdown. So another running game there. Uh, let's see, Vikings, they are now 4-1. and one. They're quietly being good. Hmm. Uh, Vikings at 4-1. and one. They beat the Bears 29-22. Bears slipped to 2-3 and three on the season. 
Uh, let's see here. Again, three rushing touchdowns. Kirk Cousin with a touchdown on the ground, and Dalvin Cook had 94 and two touchdowns. So uh, another game with a ground. It, this is pretty interesting to note how significant the ground game is right now. Um, all right. So we know Tom Brady is obviously in Tampa. We know Mac Jones is kind of on the shelf right now. If I, if knowing all of that, what would you think the score of a Patriots game would be? Are they they're playing uh, Tampa? No, 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 no. They played Detroit. Oh, okay. But knowing that the Patriots, like they no Tom Brady, mm-hmm. no Mac Jones. They have this kid. Uh, uh no. Um, who was it? Can't, was it Hoyer? That was the backup. They're on their third string quarterback, basically. Are they really? Yeah, they're on their third string quarterback. This Bailey wow. Zappi or Zappi or Zappi. Oh, that's, that's you... right. Yeah, the soccer player. It's, ah, that's it. these stupid ads. Pause. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, the guy, the guy with the soccer player name. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what would you think? Like the score. I mean, sure they played the Lions, but come on, third string quarterback, right? Yeah, what so you, you like 10, 10, 7, 14, 10, You know, low scoring. Games. So you would not expect to pull up, you know, box scores or watch a game and think twenty nine nothing. No, good thing I'm not a handicapper. And, and if you did, you would likely think that the Detroit Lions had a blowout win, right? Well, I would think they, you know, they would have won. I mean, Detroit's not that good, so I mean, you know, that's why I they figured it, it was either fourteen. Been, they got a quarterback that's been to a Super Bowl. Like the Patriots mm-hmm. are running a third string guy out there. Yeah. Anyway, it was twenty nine nothing Patriots. Um, once again, the ground game. Ramondre Stevenson had one hundred and sixty one yards rushing. Um. Zappy or Zap, I, I I doubt he's listening to our podcast, but anyway, he went 17 to 21, 188 yards. One Just call him the soccer player. One pick. Yeah, the 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 soccer oh, name. Man, he's, he's uh, Bailey Z. Yeah, the soccer Bailey player Z. smoked it. He did. Uh, his favorite receiver was a gentleman by the name of Jacoby with an I Myers. Uh, had seven catches, 111 yards, and a touchdown. So. Uh, some, you know, the next man up scenario went on here, but a big win for, for new England. And we'll have to see Does Mac Jones lose his job to the third stringer. Um, yeah, no interesting way. story going on here, but the Patriots are two and three. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, let's see here. New Orleans, uh, Taysom Hill, I believe finished that game off with a 60 yard run to cap a 39, 32 victory over the Seahawks. We already discussed the massive New York Jets, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 40-17 to over the Dolphins. Tampa, Brady (laughs) rolls to a 21-15 win over Atlanta. Tennessee beats Washington, 21-17. San Fran wins 37-15 over Carolina. Uh, You know, let's see. Baker was how, twenty of thirty six for two. How bad do you? Th- how bad do you think that Brady misses Gronk? Um, I mean, he had three hundred fifty one yards today, so uh, he's found yeah, somebody but, he likes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm just, I'm not seeing Brady as being Brady this year, just by you know his body well, language. I know he's got, uh, I know he's got other stuff going on and everything else, but. He just doesn't look like, you know, he's he's all there. I'll say this. The man's got, you know, outside the game issues going on. He retired and came back. I, I'll tell you this much. If I was in a position to where I was financially capable to say, I'm retiring. I'm not doing this no more. I'm going to go live my life, have fun, right? And then mm-hmm. just a few short months later, I'm like, ah, no, nah, I want to go back and play. And then it causes issues in my marriage. Likely his kids are like, what are you doing, dad? 
He doesn't have his right hand man, Gronkowski. But let's face it, the man is how old? 40, what is he, 45 or something like that? Oh, this no. stupid ads. What, how old is Brady now? What, I've done like 40, I don't 42, 43? I don't, I don't think he's that old. He's 45. Is he, he 45? Born, yeah, I'm 42, and I knew he was older than me. He was born August 3rd, 1977. He's 45 years old. Damn. I, I am sorry. The man is playing football at 45 years old. I am going to say throwing 350 yards in the NFL at 45 years old in a single game. I would be proud of him to do that in an entire season. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that, but I'm what I'm saying is, you know, just by his body language, it's just not it's it's not the same. It, it really yeah. isn't. You can see that. I don't know if it's all just Gronk. I mean, you got to think. He had the whole Antonio Bryant thing that was like, what, last year? You know, tried to help that man out. Um, Again, he he retired, come back. You know, then he's got all the mess going on. Think of it this way. A lot of times players don't even want to discuss their contract or like a contract Mm -hmm. extension going Mm -hmm. on during the regular season. Imagine what it's like to know that your wife is discussing like divorcing you. Yeah. But then, and that's where that's where I think all this stuff came about. You know, I think she was already, you know, well, I'm I'm not privy to that bedroom. So I I'm just thinking that there was already issues there and this is why he's playing football and he's just like, "Look, I just need to get away to, away from that. I just don't want to be around that." I understand that. You know, nobody, nobody wants to go through that, whether you're a man or a woman, you, you know, nobody yeah, wants I mean, to go through that. But, but you say you're looking but, at his demeanor that has to weigh on him. I mean, and sure. I don't know nothing about his personal life and I, it's none of my business. I just have to think like if a guy doesn't want to even negotiate his contract during the season and that's like his job, you know, if, if my boss at my job came up and said, Hey, you know, we want to discuss giving you a raise or what have you. I'd be like, mm-hmm. all right, let's go to your office. And sometimes yeah. these players are like, we don't want to deal with it right now. We want to focus on the game, you know. And, and so if he's got something outside going on and he's dealing with the, the personal issues of his marriage and everything while the season's going on, it's, I mean, it's understandable. It's a, yeah, You can't I, expect him to not, oh. not struggle a little bit. But yeah. they're still I, three I, and two. I mean, he's, you know. I honestly thought that he was going to wind up in Miami. I really did. You know, it, I thought that the little hush hush and the quiet stuff that was going on behind the scenes, it you know they were gonna they were gonna make the move and and move him to to Miami, and you know he was gonna you get what he wanted. Tampa really wanted Tua. Well, I mean, <laughs> they 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 were willing they were willing to take him, but they wanted they wanted you know too many picks behind it along with it, and you know Miami wasn't gonna wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so, as I mentioned, San Fran, San Fran was 30, or they won 37 15. Philly, 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 fly, Eagles, fly. The Feagles won? They are the, they're still the only team. 5 and 0. Left undefeated. Yeah. yeah, they're um, 5 and 0 then. Yep. Again, uh, so this wasn't so much like running back rushing, but. Hurts threw for 239. He was 26 of 36, 239. No touchdowns, but he did have 61 yards on the ground with two touchdowns. And we have more ads because I keep forgetting to pause them when I go. And ESPN has to make their money on ads. <laughs> um, next up, this shout out to uh, Kent Card Collector, aka Guns Card Guns Collectibles, was his old name on YouTube. Uh, Thoughts are with you, brother. Um, he went to the Rams game today. He is a big Rams fan. And Dallas. Oh, no. Walked into L.A. And said, nope. 22 to 10 victory for the Cowboys. They are now 4-1. and one. Dallas, or sorry, Los Angeles Rams fall to 2-3. and three. Um, Cooper Rush had a massive game. Of 102 yards passing, Matt Stafford <laughs> tripled his numbers at 308 with a touchdown and a pick. But Stafford got roughed up pretty good, uh, sacked five times. Um, but anyway, uh, 
there was only one offensive touchdown, it looks like. Uh, unless I'm missing something. Let's see here. Yeah, there was one rushing touchdown for Tony Pollard. Eight carries, 86 yards on a touchdown. Um, and Cooper Rush didn't have any passing touchdowns. So 22-10 to 10 victory for the Cowboys. And um, right now, the Ravens going started 13-26 in the second quarter. Ravens are up 10-0, so we are still at 14 seconds. This <laughs> is going to be my thing. Two and two, 14 seconds deficit. That's it. Um, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Need to make, need to make a t-shirt. Like, I, I don't know. After having, like, 20-plus point leads, I believe, and both losses as well. It's just crazy to think about. But let's uh, talk about some baseball a little bit because we both love baseball. Um, let me go over here. So what do you think of the new format? Did you pay attention much of the uh, wild card series that went on? No. Four, uh, four wild card games over this weekend? No, nope, I haven't watched anything, man. I, I've been so busy. You know, last week with the industry summit, and then you know this week it's just it's been, it's been one of them weeks. So I haven't I haven't even had time to sit in front of the TV. All right, so I'm sure you're familiar though. They they have a, a best of three, uh, yeah. playoff thing now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was very interesting to me. Like, I I didn't know. I liked like experiencing a playoff wild card game with the Nationals and how that game played out. The excitement of knowing that you know in the seventh inning we were down and that could have been it. Like Josh Hader was coming in to close that game out, and Nats would have been going home, and that was the end of our playoff run. One so and you, done, right? So you like that of March Madness and college basketball? You know the NFL playoffs, single elimination. You lose, you're out. Yeah, that excitement is like creates that vibe for the playoffs and everything. So I didn't sure. know how this MLB thing would be going on. Um, so far, I don't know if it's really added anything. Uh, you had the Mariners play the Blue Jays. Mariners won that series, you know, two well, games to none. It's definitely added more revenue, right? Well, so I want to see how it moves forward in the playoffs. That's what I'm more curious of because – Right now, so Mariners won. They beat the Blue Jays. They were down like seven runs in the, the game, too, and they came back and won it. So it was basically a collapse on the Blue Jays' behalf. But they were a five seed, beat the, the four seed, so Mariners advanced. Guardians, they beat the Tampa Bay Rays. They advanced two games to none. So, you know, two games, boom, done. Phillies, they knocked the Cardinals out. Two games, done, boom, they're out. The only game that's actually taken more than two games is the Mets Padres. Right now, the Padres are up over the Mets. So I'm thinking, how does this affect moving forward in the playoffs now? Because you got these better teams that are having to sit there with a longer wait time. And but then on the on the other token of it, you got these wildcard teams having to play multiple games and using up maybe an extra pitcher they didn't intend to use um i remember like in the nats wild card game it was no it was all hands on deck you know scherzer pitch strasburg corbin like every pitcher was available right. and, you know how does this move forward when you got a plan for multiple starters but your your roster you have an extended roster but you, you i'm talking like starting pitching though i mean with oh. one wild card game you can plan out and then you get a break. And also now it extends the wild card, like, you know, the layoff for like the Dodgers and the Astros and the Yankees and all those guys, mm -hmm. the, the Braves, that's been a little bit longer, I believe. I'd yeah. have to go back and look at how, what the gap was between the wild card game to the start of the actual playoff, like the uh, divisional rounds. But I'm pretty yeah. sure it's like extended it a game or two. You know, diehards are, are basically the only ones that are going to watch any of the preliminary rounds of of the baseball series. They're just not even going to take part in it you know, unless you're a diehard. Because most people will just watch the World Series because they say, man, it just takes too long to get there. 
It's like, you know, we're, we're waiting a month. We're going through the playoffs for, for a solid month here before we even get to the World Series. I must be a diehard then because I love postseason and any sports, even if my team's not in it. Yeah. Um, you know, even if I'm not sitting and watching every game specifically, just, you know, keeping up with it and seeing how things go. No, I'm I'm the same way, but I'm just saying the average fan, the average fan's not going to sit there and you know and purge through through all the divisional series games and and everything else. They're they're going to want to watch the World Series and that's it. If even that, you know, people the attention span for people is very you know very minimal. So right now, um, and I did. There was a question asked when I was live with Carlos on Friday night of which of the one and O teams. Uh, or the teams that were down, you know, 0-1 in the wild card round, which team would be most likely to come back? And I actually did, surprisingly, I picked the Mets. I said I was hoping the Cardinals, uh, just because Bryce Harper had never advanced in the MLB playoffs. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't mind Harper getting sent home. But I said the team realistically would be the Mets to have the best chance to come back. Um, They did win game two so far tonight. Uh, they've only got one hit, so Uh-oh. they're down 4 0, top of the seventh. Um, so yeah, it doesn't look like they're gonna. I mean, I, I better not say that. I better not say that. I'm a Ravens fan, and anything is possible with teams coming back. Um, as we noticed, 14 seconds. Um, so you know, bottom of the ninth, the Mets may make a run and come back and take the lead. Who knows? But as of this moment, it looks like that. Every team that won the first game is going to wind up advancing. So that's something interesting to note. Hmm. Um, but anyway, all right, there is your recap for sports over this weekend so far. Um, we always like to do this on the Monday episodes, a little, little water cooler talk. Uh, now let's get into a little hobby talk. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned to it, um, I know last weekend, or uh, yeah, it was last weekend when you went to the summit. Yeah. Um, you were going to go to the Vegas show this weekend. Unfortunately, yep. you said you did not, you were not able to make that. Yeah. Uh, but we both kind of like, I, I was just seeing some posts here or there. Uh, but you said you talked to some folks. Uh, fill, fill all the listeners in with the vibe and the, the chatter that you heard of folks who actually attended the well, Vegas show. Well, let me let me first start by saying that I've already told you, but um, we've been invited to do a a live pod, podcast from there at the next show. So they're going to have a show here sometime. Uh, I believe it's probably either going to be February or March. They haven't decided yet, but we've been invited to come do our, you know, the card chatter at at the Las Vegas card show. So I, I thought that was pretty neat, and it was it was pretty cool that we were asked to do that. Um, I I graciously accepted, and, and of course, you know, we had talked about it and, and, and all that. Um, but now here's the the down and dirty part of, about the show because, of course, we don't you know we don't play favorites here, and and we don't sugarcoat anything. Uh, everyone that that I've spoken to, you know, and there was quite a few guys that were sending me messages and, and, and pictures and of, of everything. The attendance tended to be a little bit light and it was a lot of ultra modern stuff. And even there was even some guys that actually even abandoned their tables, you know, because of the poor turnout, which is not a good thing. You know, I, I feel it has a lot more to do with the economy than, than the show itself, because truthfully, that show is a fantastic show. It, it really is. So, so I, real quick, it, mm-hmm. real, real quick to interrupt you there, because I've been hearing a lot of talk on the economy part of it. But I had a, a thought about this, specifically not only just this weekend, but this Vegas show, right? Okay. So it, they planned this the weekend, essentially right after there's been hobby events going on in Vegas pretty much like last weekend and several days throughout the week with the industry summit. Right. So that I was wondering, could that have played a part of it? Because like where people planning to then spend like 10 days in Vegas, two weeks, you also had the Midwest monster that was planned. You also had the New York comic con going on. So you Mm -hmm. had, you know, three pretty 
decent sized events. You had one on the West Coast, one in the Midwest, and then one on the East Coast. Could that have played some of it to the attendance factor? Not only just the fact that there was something going on in all three regions, but the fact that they were just coming out of the summit there. Yeah, that's that's very well possible. I mean, you know, right now, and I'm I'm one of those guys, you know, that's gonna call a spade a spade. the The economy's not good, you know. I've I've got tenants that are that are struggling, you know, and so it's it's no joke. So these guys are not spending money. So if if people aren't spending money, you know, I mean, what what can you do? These these three hundred table shows are gonna start dropping off real quick. You know, if if the economy doesn't get better, gas is going back up again, which is unfortunate. You know, it's it's just it, it, it's silly. You know, that disposable income is just not there for people. This is something and, and you know, I don't want to get into the political side of anything, but on a topic of the economy and in that whole situation, because this is something that. I try to look at. In a hobby perspective you know, only type thing. Mm -hmm. And I hear it again, like I said, I've heard it a lot. There's a lot of, you know, talk out on YouTube or, you know, in private conversations or whatever of the economy affecting the sports card, like hobby. Right. And I'm really curious because maybe I'm just like blind to it. Maybe it's something else that I'm like, I don't understand uh, the scope of, people who are like in this this situation but how many people actually are using i guess earned income off of paychecks or whatever to put them into the hobby space versus how many actually use the hobby to fund the hobby so to speak now the reason i ask that is I know a lot of people, and let's be real, we can hope that, you know, everybody in the hobby is collectors, but that's not the case. It right. basically grew because of the financial uh, interest of sports cards and people looking for a side hustle or a way to make extra monetary, you know, financial income or whatever. Or the green. So it, like, had me curious if the economy is weak like how is that necessarily drawing to effect on the sports card side outside of maybe so many people took losses that they're now crippled in their hobby uh, account and like they're not able to buy as much because it, 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 I'm just nobody's trying to relate the two right well nobody's nobody's actually buying anything you, you know so if, if nobody's buying and and I've gotten, I mean, my, my phone is full of voicemails right now of, of people that sent me voicemails here in the last three days for collections. And tomorrow, that's one of those things that I'm going to do after I get out of the uh, the children's hospital. I'm, I'm going to sit there and start calling everybody back. But uh, I've already got a list, I know, waiting for me of people wanting to sell collections. I mean, that's it, it's bad right now, you know, and, and there's just aren't, there aren't enough buyers out there to to you know to offset the the market which is good for you know for me being a a collection buyer and all and me being a a liquidator that that i am i i always make money in in lean times you know i actually make more money when the economy is bad versus the economy being good but um it's not it's not healthy out there for the sports card market because a lot of people, you know, were robbing Peter to pay Paul. They're playing with those credit cards. And that's, you know, that's one hell of a slippery slope right there when you're extended out on a credit card and you're trying to buy to flip. And, you know, that's why I said, you know, if you're. Do you think it's the, that there's particular, um, how do you, you mentioned there's a lot of ultra modern, at the show and everything, or, yeah. or that, that there there was a mention of a lot of it. Do yeah. you think it is is because you just said that people aren't buying, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess but, maybe the reason I'm hold on, confused on this. hold on, let me cut you off real quick. Let me tell you why they're not buying though, because be- dealers are still not coming off of their prices. 
you know, and that was a, that was a number one thing that was told to me here that the dealers were still firm on their damn prices and they're acting like their stuff is, is still, you know, six, six months ago what the prices were. So, okay. That, so go that's ahead. what, that, that's a perfect statement right there then. Cause I was going to say, I'm, I sit here and I pull my eBay store up, right. And they okay. give you all your performance numbers and all that. And, you know, there's this talk about the economy and you mentioned people aren't buying. Well, when I go to my eBay store, I'm looking here and I'm like, my total sales over the last 31 days. And granted, I've, you know, I've listed a few more things than I normally do. I kind of try to focus more. I, I, I go in waves, right? But I'm 87% on my total sale number than I was the previous 31 days. My, my item sold is up 74% for the last 31 days than it was the previous 31 days. Okay, let me ask you a quick question. Well, and what are your price points though? What, where's your number at? What's your average? So my average, my average number is 26.50 an item, okay? Which- it's not, it's not bad. I've actually adjusted. Now, if I showed you my 2021 numbers, it's hilarious because I on eBay, I did not sell that many items but my overall number of amount sold was absolutely silly. It was like three, four hundred dollars average an item, I think. Um, anyway, <laughs> I've I've went more back to the lower end. I've been doing, like I said, I started doing plain white envelope stuff where that's I do two dollar to twenty dollar items, and that's a lot of fun. But it also keeps people engaged, and it's keeping funds going into my hobby account. But you sure. just mentioned something there. You said that the dealers aren't moving off their prices so people aren't buying. So this nope. is why I'm like battling with this economic thing because there's buyers there. They're just not trying to pay at the inflated market prices. So right. it's not that people aren't buying. It's people that aren't buying overpriced items. And that is fair. I mean yeah. – we can't, as a hobby, say, oh, well, the, the hobby's down because the economic impact. If there's buyers going to shows, there's buyers wanting to buy cards, they just don't want to pay more than what the, the, the market, the fair price is on that card right now. I get, you know, sure. three, four months ago, it might have been higher. I get the dealer might have paid more for it. But the buyer isn't going to pay for the dealer's loss, so to speak. Right. Sure. So that, that's why I kind of I was glad you mentioned that because I've been like struggling with this because I'm seeing sales like last week, I think on Monday or no, I think it was Wednesday. Um, I had like 24 items I had to deliver to the post office from people buying in my eBay store. And I'm like, I keep Sweet. hearing that the economy is screwing with the sports card space. But most people that I know, they have a hobby account. You know, they, they move little cards mm -hmm. or cards they don't want or whatever. They buy other cards. You know, it, it's essentially trading in, in an aspect, but except financial right. transactions have to take place, you know, sell stuff yeah. you don't yeah. want to buy stuff you do want. So it's kind of like trading, right. but not direct You're trading. washing. Yeah, yeah. You're just washing. And, and that's why so, I tried to, you know, give you the perspective of, of, of my end of being a liquidator because – you know, there's there's a certain number that's always going to be at the market, no matter what, whether it's commodities, you, you know, precious metals, you, you know, corn, what, whatever. It, it makes no bit of difference. There's a certain level that everybody can play at and play at healthy. And then there's a number that just crosses a line that everybody says, hey, you know what? I can't. That's not my sandbox any longer. And, oh, that, yeah, and that's, yeah. you know, and, and that's. That's the thing. The numbers, that's why I asked you what your average, you know, sale price was. So, you know, realistically, you're, you're probably your number is anywhere from like, what, eight to eight to fifteen dollars on really, really average what you're really moving. And and anybody can play at that level. Right. I mean, we could so still enjoy have enough fun and still have enough fun with it. So here I'll, I'll, I'll give a transparent perspective out there. I've sold mostly on eBay this year. Um, so when we compare the two, I did sell a lot outside of eBay in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. I just haven't done as much of that this year because again, I shifted into the lower pricing point of cards, right? I wasn't sure. selling these hundred, 200, $500 cards 
thousand dollar cards. I was going, I seen the market shift and I was like, okay, I'm going to just have fun right now. I'm going to start playing in the lower cards. I got all this stuff sitting here. If somebody's paying me $5 for a card that I don't want, that's just going to sit in a box. That's $5 that I can put on eBay and make five bucks back. Right. So right. That's what I, I remember, I remember you saying you were doing really good with that as well. Right. Well, this year for 2022, my average, my average sales price per item is $31 and 46 cents. That is my average across since January 1st, 2022. Uh, and just for perspective, I've sold 425 items on eBay this year at an average of 3146. Last year, because I can pull this up, it gives me fancy little reports. Oh, you're going to be overinflated there. So last year, I sold 110 items on eBay. So essentially 25%, and we're only in October, and I've already sold four times the amount of items this year than I did in 2021. But my mm -hmm. average sale price per item in 2021 was two hundred twenty four dollars and three cents. <laughs> so basically, I'm still doing well. I just yeah. adjusted what I'm selling. I'm right. not focusing and trying to sell the big ticket items. I shifted right. into the lower stuff, the collector stuff. Believe it or not, there's many people yeah. out there that like these five, ten, twelve dollar cards. Um, sure. Because everybody you know, can play in that sandbox. That's what I said. Exactly. You know, it, you know, it, and it doesn't also, hurt us. It's also easier to spend ten dollars, and okay, fine. If it drops to eight dollars, you only lose two dollars. Than it is <laughs> to spend five hundred dollars and it drops to two hundred dollars and you lose three hundred dollars. Sure. There's a big, uh, a big difference there. Even though, like percentage wise, the the decrease may be the same the value margin is much larger and so people are much more um open to spending you know 10 12 15 dollars on a card and if mm -hmm. it goes down okay you know they don't like losses but it's easier to swallow losing a couple dollars versus a couple hundred dollars so okay okay so like like myself, when when I do buy on eBay, because I do, I buy I buy quite a bit. I've been buying a lot of uh, ninety three finest refractors right now, graded stuff that's on there. So if anybody wants to compete, let me know, or go ahead and outbid me because I've I've been <laughs> I've been on probably twenty to thirty a week, you know that that I'm trying to get just to work on my graded sets. Let but, uh, real quick, real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't want this to cross any wires because people talk about that crap too. If you're bidding on them, uh, you're not meaning like when you say compete, talking about bidding against you to run prices up and all that stuff. You're basically yeah. saying, look, I've been on a bunch of this. If you're interested or you're trying to buy any, let me know because you'll hold back or whatever. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't want, I don't want to hurt nobody. You know? Okay. I, I wanted to make sure that was clarified because yeah. I don't, I don't want it to be thought of. Uh, oh well, he's you're sitting here saying you want to compete against me. Let's go. So um, anyway, uh, okay, <laughs> go back to it. No, I, I, I just know that there's, you know, there's, there's sets. There are other set builders out there right now that are that are working on it too and stuff. So, and again, not that they're listening, but it, anyway, we, you know, like I said, we can all play in that in that sandbox that we can afford to play in, but. Myself, I don't, when I buy something, I don't look at it, it, okay, it's worth this amount of money. I buy it because if I need it for my set and I'm, I'm going to buy it, and, and of course there's times I've overpaid for stuff, but I never look back, you know, I never look back and say, okay, this is what I paid for it. If it's gone down or if it's gone up, I don't know. I truthfully don't know because I don't, I, I, I no longer factor in the money after I've already sent it through PayPal and it's already done and I've paid the, you know, the, the seller it's, it's out of sight, out of mind to me as a collector. That's the, I only care about the card. I don't care about the money. The money has no value to me. The, the money only has value because I have to use it. Otherwise I wouldn't, you know, well, I mean, so. truthfully, 
like once you buy the item, the value is in a nothing. It's not exactly. It's basically zero because it doesn't regain a value until you go to resell it. And right. you it don't have an intent or plan of reselling it. So therefore it's just a I, I can't remember the term, but there's a term for it where it 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 doesn't have value because it's it's like buying a knickknack to put on your shelf. Okay, you pay yeah, twenty dollars fun- for it because you wanted it on your shelf, but the value of it is just to sit there and give you enjoyment by looking at the knickknack on your shelf. Right. Right. It's considered so, a flat asset. You know, it's flat. Yeah. It's not going anywhere, it's not doing anything. And, and when at the yeah. time, if you decided to sell, then the value comes back into play and it may have increased, it may have decreased. It's all dependent sure. on the next buyer and what the next right. buyer is willing to pay. So now, so um, my I, question was, so my question was, how do you, how do you feel when you're buying something on, on eBay like that? Do you factor in the cost and say, okay, well, this is how much it is and this is how much I want to pay because maybe I will flip it out. Or maybe it's going to my collection, and do I still think about how much I paid for that card six months down the road? Uh, when I'm buying stuff, yeah, uh, most of the time, if it's PC items, which is mostly what I buy on eBay, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't really like. I might, in the back of my mind, remember what I paid for something, but sometimes, like. Uh, I think I showed you my Max Scherzer Bowman Chrome Refractor rookie. Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, like I didn't realize how much those cards even were because once you know I bought mine in 2017 and I never gave it any more thought. And I had seen, I think it was Ryan Satterley sent one in. He sent in maybe the regular one. It wasn't even the refractor, and it reminded me. And I was like, you know, I'm curious what what is Max doing right now? You know, he's had some good years and stuff, and likely Mm -hmm. a hall of famer and everything and so i pulled it up and i was like holy crap and i I was curious and i went back and found i still have a picture because i was so excited that i got that card when i bought it in 2017 i actually have a picture i took in 2017 of what i paid for the card and i think i paid like three dollars and 21 cents or something like that maybe seven dollars <laughs> i i don't remember it's a bgs9 copy of the bowman chrome scherzer rookie refractor um mm-hmm. it's worth a lot more today does that mean i'm selling it no it's still sitting on my shelf back there um yeah. th- most of my stuff i couldn't tell you if like if it was really for pc now i will say in 2020 in 2021 when things got crazy I had bought stuff that was for my collection and maybe it was because it was so new of me obtaining the items and me seeing, you know, people talking about the prices that it caught my attention more, but I knew Mm -hmm. it was, I'm going to say smart to move out of them just because of how quickly and volatile I knew those prices were. Like my Jordan, my Fleer Jordan, I was excited to get it. It was a card I really wanted. It was an ugly copy of the card. I'm not going to play it off. It was an ugly copy, but I had a Jordan Fleer. It didn't make any sense, though, when it went from 2000 to 8000 in the matter of minutes, you know, essentially, so to speak. It was a couple months, but it, it went up mm-hmm. way too quickly. And there's times and opportunity that, I have let go of things just because I knew it didn't make sense what they got to. I am the Mm -hmm. first one. I sat right here on camera. I'm a Ravens fan. I love Lamar Jackson, but I I believe it was his prism rookie had reached like, I don't remember 3,700 or 1,300. I can't even remember what it was now, but I owned a gem mint copy of that card. And I sat right here on camera and said, That is stupid. That card should never be worth that much. And I sold mine. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, it could go up even further. It's very close to the moon. Let's get it to the moon. No, because I knew that should not be where it was. And so you're never going to time the market at its peak. You're never going to time a card at its bottom. You really, the best wins you're going to have in this hobby is just buying stuff because you enjoy it and because you right. love it. 
Right, because it's the long term play. It's always right. the it's always the long term play. That's why I asked the question because I you know I see a lot of a lot of people that say that they're collectors, and you know, and again, I'm not poo pooing anyone here, but if you're truly a collector, then you're not going to factor the the dollar amount. I mean, look, you just mentioned the Jordan, so I have ten PSA nines. Mm-hmm. I'm. Mean, Look at the money I could have made on the damn things, right? But I don't. I don't care about the money. You know, it, it's not that I. I one I didn't need it. If I needed it, it would be different. You know, if if I needed to take care of my family, okay. You know, I, I got to do what I got to do. But not. It, I'm, I'm a collector. I just enjoy the stuff. So again, it's a flat. You. It's a flat asset. It makes no money until it leaves when I'm gone. So in 2021. At that point, I had the Kareem. I had all top five scorers, rookies. Mm -hmm. And I had LeBron tops. I had the Kareem rookie. I had the uh, Bird Magic, the Jordan, and the Carl Malone 86 Fleer. When I seen how volatile and how wacky the basketball card prices were going, and when I seen how wacky and weird the football prices and stuff were going, one reason I got rid of all that stuff is, A, I've lost a lot of interest in those sports to begin with because of the rule changes or just the way the players and the game and everything have, have been. Um, some political nonsense that goes on in there. I don't enjoy the politics side of, of sports. And I just kind of was getting detached from the nonsense that was going on in those spaces with cards. So at that moment, I kind of decided, all right, I'm going to get rid of most of the stuff I have in those sports, and I'm going to use that. And so did I get rid of my Jordan? Yeah. Did I get rid of the Bird Magic? Yeah. Did I enjoy owning those cards? Yes. But what I used them for was then being able to buy like my Jackie Robinson 52 tops, you know, mm. that was a card I mentioned I wanted or the Babe Ruth that I got. I put that back in to other cards that like I'm more strongly attached to uh, because simply yeah, I that, love meant, baseball that, more. that meant more to you. Yeah. Those yeah. meant more to me. And mm -hmm. by that validity of that market where it infl inflated and me recognizing, look, you know, this stuff was great to own. I have the stories, uh, but I can now use that to get something else that might mean even more to me. Um, that's why I made the choice to do so, because I, I just think, again, I've, I've talked about like purging the collection and kind of like refocusing back into what I enjoy more. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm talking about. Like sometimes it's you buy things and it's cool. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say you are or are not a collector if you sell a card, because there's opportunity, there's things happen in people's lives, uh, your yeah. interests change, you know. Um, sure. So every it, everyone sells. Let's just put it yeah. out there again. Everyone sells. There's just different degrees of how you sell. You know, some people will sell a lot. Some people will sell to play with their their our hobby continuously because you know a lot of guys are married and they have to answer to the higher power the higher power doesn't want you spending money you know on your cardboard i understand bills have to be paid you know i mean we're we're not all that lucky in this world that you know we have carte blanche with with wives you know i mean how, how many how many wives do you know that are in the sports card hobby I know yours is, but I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of them out there. Yeah, I so, mean, there, there's a few here or there. Um, right, right. But, but and, and I guess it's more like every collector, for the most part, and I can't say every, but for the most part, most collectors at some point sell something to fund buying another card. That's why I said like yeah. the whole economy thing. Like for the most part, guys are. I'm going to say like myself, like I have to sell cards. If I wasn't selling cards, I wouldn't be buying cards. Yeah. You know, that, that's just all it is to it. I don't, I wouldn't have enough financial means to go out and buy the cards that I have. Right. But I so, know, 
but I know the economy is bad because, and this right, is how right. I, th- but this is how I know the economy is bad because I have a ton of voicemails on my phone for collections right now. And before that wouldn't have happened. You know, well, when the econ- when the economy was good, it, it just didn't happen. I was struggling going out there. I'd have to be on Facebook marketplace and I'd have to be the first one to send a message. And sometimes I would even send people money as a deposit and just say, Hey, I'll be there in a, you know, in a few hours or I'll see you in a few days. You know what I mean? It, it got to that though, point. Here's the, here's the thing though. Could this be an effect of the actual economy that people are selling their collections off or is it the sports card economy and and what i mean by that is when the economy was good or over the past couple years so to speak Mm -hmm. it wasn't hard to make money like you could legit go to the store and rip a blaster and usually sell whatever in it and make a profit sure and now you can't do that like it's difficult it's no, I, difficult to, yeah. to rip wax and make profit, or it's even difficult to flip wax to make profit, mm-hmm. let alone flip cards to make profit. You know, right? Is that part of it? Is it the sports card economy is bad? No, I, I think part of it. No, I, I truly think it's the basic economy itself. You know, I, I mean, I, I know guys that have taken second jobs. You know, and, and it's like, you know, I, I get people all the time asking me, hey, do you have any side work? Do you know, do you know anybody who's hiring? And and I'm like, you know, I just they're tough and people are just and the jobs that are out there, they're just like minimum wage jobs, man. And and it's so sad because you're you're basically working, you know, two jobs to basically, you know, try to stabilize your household income. And you're you just don't have extra money to do other things. So of course, you know your your little playtime gets the, hurt. Uh, what are the what are you seeing in the collections that are presented to you though to buy? Is this ultra modern stuff, or is it junk wax, or is it vintage e- lifelong everything. collections, or e- everything? Everything. That's the reason why I'm like curious on that. If it's ultra modern stuff, I'm wondering if it's people that got into it, seeing the potential, how easy it was in 2020, 2021 to make some money on sports cards didn't get out or bought too much and everything went on a downturn and now they're like oh crap i've spent all this money on wax or ultra modern stuff and it's just not easy to sell and make profit on anymore so now they're trying to get something back i mean i I, yes i know i'm curious yeah there is a lot of ultra modern stuff that's you know that's going to be offered to you it's very slim is going to be on the on the true vintage stuff but like i i mean you know that i do some stuff with with a couple auction houses out here and and i do appraisals for them and, and that kind of stuff so um their their sports card you know their section of of their auctions they they were doing anywhere between eight to ten thousand per per week and they were selling 100 like between 100 to 150 lots you know per auction house and so like i said the numbers were between like eight to ten thousand really is what they were doing each one of them now um i believe i looked because i only looked for a little bit yesterday and i got through almost a hundred hundred lots and they had barely cracked three grand you know, so it's the economy is just tough. It, it's just people are not spending because people are worried that they just don't have enough money to, to pay everything else. You know, the winter is going to be a big deal for people. So, you know, gas prices are at the pump are not the only gas prices people are worried about. Right. Yeah. And, and I think what we're just into right now, and again, I, I, I want to make it clear. I'm not sitting here trying to say, that the economy or you know whatever is in a good place definitely not trying to say that i think i'm just more and this is just like why i enjoy us doing this podcast and we have this conversations like this between both of us because i wonder if it's not like and i don't even want to say it's the perfect storm but it's the the mixture of the witch's brew so to speak of not only a down turn over the past you know year plus 
you know, because essentially since February 2021, the entire sports card market softened up. Mm -hmm. And so you have that combined with the bad economy. And I almost wonder if sometimes, like when I hear this economy talk within the sports card space, if when everything was going up, people were blaming it on the pandemic. Like, oh, it's, you know, the, the pandemic that's causing these outrageous prices and the influx of people to the hobby and this, that, and the other. And now that we have this downturn, it's like we need an excuse of, well, now it's the economy. So it's like on both shifts, we created this reasoning for it of happening. But the truth is the upswing should have never happened as extreme as it did to begin with. And so now I just wonder if some of the impact that isn't being seen further is just this mixture. Like we had this timing of everything going up and people have taken massive losses because it shouldn't have been up there to begin with. And it started swinging down. And then you had the government and all of its, you know, financial stuff, inflation's going up, gas prices going up, all this. So the economy itself is getting tighter. So you have this mix of people that lost buying in at a hype point and their card values are being less. So they're they're taking a hit on their wallet right there. And then you also have the economy on top of it. So I'm wondering if this is not a tornadic activity within sports cards of both the downturn and the losses being and you know incurred from that, mm -hmm. as well as the tightness on the wallet of the actual economy. And, and people are just wanting to say the economy, but they're not combining the two factors involved. Well, I mean, it, it's really the economy is, I, I truly feel is, is the issue because, I mean, I see it on the other side because, you know, I do stuff with, with a lot of charities. So, you know, I, I work a lot with this one food bank and this food bank would generally take care of 25. It's a smaller food bank. And and I try to always work with smaller places because, you know, they're less funded and they, they truly need the help. But um, they they would take care of anywhere between 25 to 30 families a week. Right now, they're doing over 70 families a week. And they don't get enough. And they just do not get enough food, you know, and they try to provide toiletries. They try to provide all these things because people just don't have that extra money to, to be able to go buy the stuff. I mean, I, I can tell you, and, and this is for a fact, that because they do this on Mondays is when they distribute everything. Um, and that's when I, you know, I usually come out to the top loader on the weekend to, to hang out over here because that's over in the small town that, that I go to. Um, so I'll go on Monday morning and I'll stop over at the food bank and I'll go see if they need any help or, or do anything, you know, that they may need. Uh, but the amount of people that are waiting in line to be able to get food, just to be able to put food on your own table has now tripled versus what they used to take care of. So, you know, I, to me, a hundred percent, the economy is, is what's going to hurt everyone. And it's a trickle down effect. It's just going to trickle down to one of those items. You know, it's kind of like if you had a storage unit, you know, bottles, it's out of sight, out of mind. You, you have a storage unit you're paying for, but you got to pay your mortgage. What what gets paid? You got to keep the roof over your head, right? You're going to sacrifice that storage unit. You're going to say, "Well, hey, you know, I can't pay it this month." Yeah, right? no, I, I get that side of it, but again, that's why, like, I'm I'm just and, and I'm again, I'm just looking at it from another side of it because no, I know you are. Thing, I'm, I, I'm not taking from my bill page and like my I, I have multiple different bank accounts. And the bank account I pay my bills with, I'm not drawing out of that to pay for, you know, to buy a, a card or a wax box or whatever, right? That's coming well, from a hobby account. Fun fact, so I will. I, I'll I pull from to, any account. What's that? <laughs> I said, fun fact, I'll pull from any account. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, myself, you know, I, I, I have three different bank accounts. I have okay. one that is strictly for all of the grading stuff. Any money that gets paid for the grading fees or whatever, that goes in one account that pays all of the grading invoices. Okay. That account does not get mixed, matched, nothing. That is strictly for grading. 
sure. have a second account that is for paying bills with or, you know, whatever life. That's my life account, so to speak. Yeah. And then I have a hobby account. Um, that's where eBay sales and all that stuff gets put into that account. Okay. So I'm not dipping from my bill or life account to play in sports cards. If my hobby well, account gets low, okay, I'm not buying anything, right? Well, well, then you're more disciplined than me because I can tell you for a fact I've I've robbed Peter to pay Paul once or twice, especially when I was trying to top out, you know, getting my 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 Jordans to get, to finish all that stuff out. And then, of course, you know, I was sweating bullets for for a little bit. I was on the ramen diet for a little bit, which wasn't bad, but you know, I had to do what I had to do. So, and, and I just wanted to explain it because that's kind of like what I'm looking at, and maybe maybe it. Maybe there is more people out there. Maybe I'm just blind to it that more people out there do, you know, say, okay, 10% of my paycheck, I'm going to buy sports cards. Well, today uh, the economy is tightened up and the bills are more. So instead of being able to do 10% of their paycheck, they're down to like a, a three or 4% of the paycheck. So then that restricts what they're buying. Um, maybe yeah. that is the case more than I am aware of. Um, and maybe that's, you know, that's why I was talking it through because in my situation, if the bills get tight, I can pull from the hobby account, right? I can sure. I can use that to help pay bills, but I'm not going to go from my bill account to buy cards. Like right. that, that, that's I got a you. one way street there. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll pull but, from one to pay bills if I need it, but I'm not pulling out of bills to pay cards. But do you There's see why? I, order there. <laughs> right. But do you see why I like buying collections though? Because then with the amount of volume that you get with the collection, you're always going to be satisfied. There's always a lot to play with, you know. Yep. So And that's a lot of what I've been selling. That's why I went yeah. and I'm like, oh, this plain white envelope stuff, this is kind of cool. The other thing that I, you know, and I'll mention this, a lot of people feel that in order to be a hobbyist or a part of the hobby or whatever, you know, we, we talked, we did the episode about gambling tied in with the sports cards or whatever a lot of people just need that action they don't know how to hit the pause button and sit out a, you know a month or so of not buying they need that constant activity yeah. well what the small stuff does is it makes you feel like you're com continuously involved because yeah. you're constantly selling and making you know yeah. sending stuff off and everything right so there's yeah, you're in activity within the you're hobby. in the game right you're in yeah. the game <laughs> right. You're, you, you're not doing $200, $2,000 sales, but all these little, you know, $5 sales or whatever and making you feel like you're doing something. And then if you want to go buy a $20 card, well, it's quick to accumulate $20, right? And then you can pop right. in and buy that $20 card. Boom. You got a mail day coming in. So that's a beautiful Which, part of this. And most of what I'm doing this with is the collections that I've bought. Yeah, like, there's so many great. easy way That's to do great. two to twenty dollar cards in these collections and just start piecing them out. And you're staying active. You're looking over the cards. You're learning like what people are buying, who people are buying, what types of yep. cards people want, that sort of thing. But then you're also building up your account a little bit if you want to buy something for yourself. Yeah, That's why I said you'll never go broke buying collections it, it, because if you buy a collection and you're really in it to, to make a few dollars, you're going to make dollars. It's just minimal dollars it's it's not maximum dollars you just got to be the minimalist when it when it comes to making that money in in a bad economy because you got to play in the sandbox that everyone else is playing in you can't go playing in the swimming pool you know right, just, right. Play, just play in the sandbox so uh just just real quick and because i know we kind of veered off a little bit but it, it was a topic you know that was great just to discuss and it also ties back in with um, what we were originally on, but as far as the Vegas show, you you said that you know it wasn't it wasn't what it was probably expected to be. No, um, it, unfortunately, it wasn't. Okay, you know it just it just it wasn't as wasn't as strong as as the last one, and and of course you know I it's because guys weren't coming off their prices. You know, they, they were firm on, on their prices. And like I said, even I, mean, I was even told that guys walked away and they abandoned their tables. They were just like, I'm out of here. I'm not making enough money. I'm, I'm leaving. What do you so, think? And maybe this is something cause we're, we're over the hour mark right now, but 
just real quick, and maybe we can go into this a little bit further for maybe the Wednesday or fr- even Friday episode, but what do you think will be the breaking point? Because this has been a topic that's been going on for a bit now. I, I don't know if it's the buyers are just wanting, they want to be buying under comps on everything and they don't understand that the dealer's got to make money too. Or if it's the dealers are just so heavily into losses on their stuff and they, they, let's face it, some of the dealers might just be new into the hobby and they mm-hmm. seen what everything was doing in 2020 and 2021 and they may not understand that's not how sports cards work, but they right. have this hope that it'll get back there or they're just so far underwater they can't let let go and take the L. Right. Just real which, quick. Which is but, foolish, which is absolutely foolish. You know, you just do what you got to do and move on and then recoup it somewhere else. This is, this is why I tell collectors stand firm relax you know play in that small sandbox for now wait for those numbers to come down because there's it's just like grading it, the numbers have to come down if you stop and you pause and you you ease up on that gas everything will slow down and they will have to readjust to you no matter what i mean it's it's simple so just real just real quick a um, little bit of final thoughts here what do you think just off the top of your head, what do you think will wind up having to happen to get to where dealers are at more realistic values? Or do you think we're just so there was such a upswing in value where people were buying and that the everything is corrected now at such an extreme, they're going to be so out of balance that it just may not happen. Yeah, the the unrealistic push bubbles is is has kind of put blinders on on dealers, you know, eyes right now, and because there's so many new dealers, it's not the the general old, old you know circuit guys because the old circuit guys that they, they know, you know, they they would say, hey, look, I'm only going to bring X, Y, and Z to the show because I know I can cut this at fifty percent, and yes, I'm going to lose a little bit of money. But I don't care because it's going to generate some revenue and give me some something back. This other stuff, I'm going to hold this back. It's okay. I know I'm taking a loss on it, but I'm holding on it, and we'll see if it'll if it'll recover some because it's not it's never going to get back to where it was. You know, it, it's no different than a stock market. You know, stocks go up, stocks come down, stocks trickle up, and then they trickle back down. So it's just a matter of position where you're buying in at. So unless Unless dealers nowadays understand that, they're, they're going to be held you know, with a bag of goods. And sooner or later, they'll be calling somebody like myself you know, or calling like the Chasing Cardboard guys out and saying, hey, come, come buy my stuff. <laughs> because right. you yeah. know, they, they're, they're they, going to want some. They have no return. choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think that'll be a topic we could touch more in depth later on. Um, I just wanted to get a quick thought on it since we were talking, you know, that the shows are struggling with dealers. You know, I, I've been hearing a lot, you know, I, I want to see how Chantilly is. That's coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, I've already got a game plan. Yeah, that'll be going interesting. In Chantilly. I already have a game plan going in, but I do want to scope out and see like how, how the vibe is there, what the dealers look like. And it has been a, a strong mm-hmm. sentiment that people are going to shows and saying, look, the dealers are just overpriced and it's hard to buy because it's overpriced. So I want to go see what the vibe is yeah. there. Um, and, if they're, you know, if they're uh, smart, a lot of dealers, if they are smart bubbles, they're going to bring a load of value boxes if they're smart because they know they can make that quick hit on those boxes real quick and make that money real fast the hopefully they're smart enough show, to do that but the of course it takes effort show, to put that together i the the reason i like that show a lot is it's a mixed show you have dealers who mm-hmm. you know have been around for years and years and years and then you have guys who are newer you know trying to be a show dealer or whatever and uh, so you get a mixed bag there, and there's usually mm-hmm. something, no matter which area, you, you know, what playground you want to go play on, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a spot for you at that show. So um, I'm sure, 
you know, I'm going to have fun no matter what, but uh, I can't wait to see what it's like. So as always, guys, uh, it's been a great episode. Uh, happy Monday. Hope your Monday goes well. Um, start to the work week. But uh, as always, we do appreciate all of you wherever you may be listening from. And uh, as always, thank you. And we will be back Wednesday. Thank you.